All right, we'll go on. <laughs> to learning about net ionic equations. So in writing equations for reactions and aqueous solutions, it's often useful to indicate whether the dissolved substances are present predominantly as ions or as molecules. Let's consider an example equation. I've got lead nitrate, which is soluble in water, and as indicated by the letters AQ, reacting with potassium iodide, which is soluble in water, to form lead iodide, which is a precipitate, as indicated by the S, which stands for solid precipitate, and potassium nitrate, which is also soluble in water. Now, when we write an equation in this fashion, that is the fashion shown here, where we show complete chemical formulas for all of the reactants and all of the products, we call this type of equation a molecular equation. Now, in this particular example, we saw that lead nitrate, potassium iodide, and potassium nitrate were all water soluble. Let's go back and prove that. You can see that lead nitrate, potassium iodide, and potassium nitrate are all water soluble as indicated by the letters AQ next to them. Lead iodide, however, was not. Thus, we can write the previous equation in a form that indicates which of the species exist as ions in the solution. That's done in this manner. Now, this is one of those things that makes students wet themselves, figuratively speaking. What I've done is I've taken each individual compound in the earlier equation, and I've sawed it in half, separating the cations from the anions and writing their charges next to them. For example, in our previous equation, we saw that lead nitrate is soluble in water. So what I'm going to do is saw this in half and write down lead with its charge next to it and the letters AQ next to it, plus nitrate with its charge next to it and the letters AQ next to it, like this. You'll note that the number two that's next to this nitrate actually ends up getting shuttled out front and to the left of the nitrate when we write it in this type of fashion. In similar vein, when we look at potassium iodide, we can see that it is soluble in water. Hence, I'm going to saw it in half, separating out a potassium plus one ion and writing AQ next to it, plus an iodide, I minus ion, and writing AQ next to it. Because there is a 2 as a coefficient in front of this whole compound, each of the individual ions, potassium plus and iodide minus, also get an individual 2 in front of them. What that essentially means is that when you take potassium iodide, 2 moles of it, and throw it into water, they will separate out into forming 2 moles of K plus and 2 moles of I minus, which are completely separate. For the lead iodide, it was insoluble in water and hence is left completely alone. For the potassium nitrate, we follow the same kind of process that we did for the potassium iodide. When we write an equation in this form, the form shown here, with all of the soluble electrolytes shown as ions, that is all of the ions separated out that are soluble, and the precipitate being shown not separated out. This is called a complete ionic equation. Now, notice that the K plus and the NO3 appear on both sides of the equation. We can see that here. K plus is right here, and NO3 minus is right here on the right side of the equation. You'll also see that there's a K plus and an NO3 minus on the left side of the equation with the exact same coefficients in front of them. Ions that look exactly the same on both sides of the complete ionic equation are called spectator ions, and they do not play any direct role in the reaction. When spectator ions are omitted from the equation, we are left with something called the net ionic equation, which only shows the ions and molecules that actually do any type of reaction. So what we can do is cross out the nitrate because it's the same on both sides. We can cross out the potassium because it's the same on both sides, just like we would an algebraic equation. Everything that is left, we take down into something that we call the net ionic equation. 
The net ionic equation, once again, only shows the ions that actually do something. So what this means is that if you were to actually take lead nitrate and potassium iodide and throw them into water, they would do a partner swap. The lead would get together with the iodide and form an insoluble precipitate, lead iodide, while the potassium and the nitrate would dissolve completely in solution. This is, once again, summarized neatly by this equation. It only shows the ions, lead and iodide, that actively do anything. That is, form lead iodide precipitate. The other ions, the nitrate and the potassium, as soon as you throw them in the water, they just dissolve out in the water, and they never get together to form a precipitate. Because any time they attempted to get together, they would just re-dissolve, because they form a compound that is completely soluble in water. So here are the steps that we have to follow in order to write a net ionic equation. Step one, write the full and balanced molecular equation as we did in our earlier example. Step two, use the solubility rules from our table that we showed earlier to determine which products are soluble in water and which ones are not soluble in water. Only the insoluble ones, which are called precipitates, and the ions from which they came participate in the reaction. Step three, Use the information from step two to create a complete ionic equation, placing AQ next to all of the ions that are soluble and S next to all of the precipitates. Step four, cancel out on both sides of the equation any ions that are AQ on both sides. Canceled out ions are called spectator ions. And step five, rewrite your complete ionic equation with your spectator ions removed. The resulting equation shown is your net ionic equation. I'll go ahead and show you how this is done by looking at an actual problem. Write balance net ionic equations for the reactions that occur in each of the following cases. Identify the spectator ion or ions in each reaction. Now I'm not going to do part B, but I will do part A and let you attempt B on your own. So let's take a look at our overall equation. Chromium sulfate getting together with ammonium carbonate. Step one says write the full and balanced molecular equation. We do this by remembering that in this type of reaction there is a partner swap. Cation A gets together with anion D and cation C gets together with anion B. What are A, B, C, and D in this particular example? Well, chromium is going to be A, sulfate is going to be B, ammonium is going to be C, and carbonate is going to be D. We now do the partner swap. Chromium gets together with carbonate, we throw them over here. Ammonium gets together with sulfate, and we throw them over here. As I talked about earlier, you might be confused by why in the world we choose the subscripts that we do. Remember that sulfate, whose formula is SO4, is an anion that I ask you to memorize, the formula for and the charge. Its charge is negative two. Now we've been given this formula in the problem, keeping in mind that each sulfate has a charge of negative two and there are three total of them, there's a total negative charge of negative six that two chromiums have to neutralize. So what charge does each chromium have to have? Positive three. Let's go to our next example. You might remember that carbonate, CO3, is an anion that I also asked you to memorize. Carbonate has a charge of negative two. Ammonium, NH4, is a cation that I asked you to memorize in an earlier chapter. It has a charge of plus one. Now remember, each NH4 has a charge of plus one. So how many NH4s does it take to neutralize a charge of minus two? It takes two of them. Hence, we put parentheses around the NH4 and put a subscript 2 next to them. When we do the partner swap, we have the ammonium, which is cation C, get together with the sulfate, which is anion B. We now have ammonium sulfate getting together. Separately, we have chromium, which is cation A, get together with carbonate, which is anion D. We write chromium carbonate over here. We'd better make sure that we write the correct subscripts in the right places. We should remember that ammonium has a charge of plus one. We've memorized it. What is sulfate's charge? It's minus two. We also should have memorized that. How many 
ammoniums, each of which has a plus one charge, does it take to neutralize a total minus charge of negative two? It takes two of them. Hence, we put parentheses around ammonium and a subscript two right there. You might remember that we memorized that carbonate has a charge of negative two. And chromium, in this example, we discovered has a charge of plus three. It stands to reason, then, that in order to have these charges balance out, I have to have two chromiums, each of which has a plus three charge, bonded together with three carbonates, each of which has a minus two charge. I've got an overall negative charge of minus six and an overall positive charge of plus six. The last thing we do now is we balance the chemical equation by putting coefficients in front of all the species that, it, that are necessary. I have done this already here, and I'm anticipating that you can do it on your own. If not, then practice. Now that we've done step one, we now move on to step two, which says we need to use the solubility rules to determine which of the products over here are soluble and which ones are insoluble in water. Only the insoluble ones called precipitates and the ions that they came from participate in the reaction. Here is that table. So let's look over here at ammonium sulfate. We go down to the table and try to find ammonium or sulfate, and we find sulfate down here, SO4 2 minus. It's in the upper half of the table, which means that every ionic compound that contains a sulfate anion is soluble in water except for strontium sulfate, barium sulfate, mercury sulfate, and lead sulfate. Is ammonium sulfate one of those? No, it's not. Hence, ammonium sulfate is soluble in water. Let's look at this product now, chromium carbonate. Let's see if we can find carbonate on our table below. Carbonate appears in the bottom half of the table, which means that every ionic compound containing carbonate anion is insoluble in water, except for ammonium carbonate and any carbonate whose cation is from group one of the periodic table. Does chromium fall into one of those categories? No, it does not. Hence, chromium carbonate is insoluble in water and will precipitate out. Having done that, we can now move on to step three, which says use the information from step two to create a complete ionic equation, which is one in which we've placed the letters AQ next to everything that's soluble in water and the letter S next to everything that isn't. Here is the way the equation looks now. Chromium sulfate is soluble in water, ammonium carbonate is soluble in water, ammonium sulfate is soluble in water, but chromium carbonate, as we saw, is not. We can now complete step three by sawing in half every single one of these compounds. Let's start with this first one, chromium sulfate. We saw it right in half, and that gives us a Cr plus three cation. This two gets moved out to the left. I'll show you that here. We, of course, indicate that the chromium plus three is also soluble in water. Sulfate anion has a minus two charge, and this three gets moved over to the left as a coefficient in front of it. Now we move on. This whole compound is soluble in water. We saw it in half to free up ammonium. How many ammoniums do we have? Well, we have this two subscript multiplied by this three coefficient. So there are indeed six ammoniums. Separately, the carbonate detaches as a carbonate minus two ion, and this three, which is the coefficient and multiplies all the way through, becomes a coefficient next to my carbonate. We will do the same process for the product side of the equation. Note that this product right here, chromium carbonate, does not get separated out because it is a precipitate, which means that when it goes into water, it stays together. It does not dissolve out and separate. Hence, it just sticks together in our complete ionic equation. Step four says we now cancel out on both sides of the equation any ions that are basically the same on both sides. Canceled out ions are called spectator ions. So here's our overall equation. Looking at the left side of the equation, which is actually the top half of the equation, as I've written here, because I couldn't fit it all into one line, and the right side of the equation, which is the bottom half of the equation, do we see anything on both sides that are identical? Well, yeah, we do. The sulfate looks exactly the same on the left and the right, so we cross it out. 
the ammonium looks exactly the same on the left and the right, so we cross it out. Now we are on to step five. We rewrite what we have left. What we have left is the net ionic equation, which in this case looks like this. Now as I stated earlier, I don't want to do part B for you, but want to give you the chance to do it on your own. Here it is. See if you can give it a try. Well, that brings us to the end of today's lecture on Chapter 4's discussion on reactions in aqueous solutions. Please tune in for the next installment from our Chapter 4 discussion in which I will teach you more wonderful things about this particular topic. Until then, have a wonderful rest of your day.